my name is Katie Kalaitis, and I'm the resident scholar at the National Hellenic Museum. And I am joined today with my fearless, fearless companion, really the Laverne to my Shirley. It's our manager of special events and programs, Kyra Dye. I really like being described as the Laverne to your Shirley. I'm, I think that's, that's great. I wasn't expecting that one and I really enjoyed it. Hi everybody, my name is Cairo. As Katie said, I'm the manager of programs and events at the museum and I'm super excited to get to hang out with one of my favorite people as always, Katie. Uh, Katie, we're, we're having a chat today about some some royalty, aren't we? Uh, what, what, what are we here to talk about today? What's, what's on, the, on the agenda? Well, so as you know, Cairo, one of my niche interests um that predates any like any inkling that I would be a historian or any of that um is 19th and 20th century European royalty and um to as you all know um this week or last week um his royal highness the duke of Edinburgh the longest serving consort in British history the the husband of the present queen um died just short of his 100th birthday um, as some of you may have noticed, as you were watching the remembrances, he was born Prince Philip of, of Greece and Denmark. He was born um, into the reigning Greek royal house at the time. Um, but I think the more interesting figure in, in that sense is his mother, um, Prince, who was born Princess Alice of Battenberg, um, but was styled Her Royal Highness um, Alice, Princess Andrew of Greece and Denmark upon her death. So um, I thought we could talk about Princess Alice, who I think is not just one of the most interesting figures in, in modern Greek history, but one of the more underappreciated and interesting women of the 20th century. And then from what, you, what you've told me so far, I'm really excited to have this conversation. She has a lot of interesting moments in her life, as well as a lot of really interesting skills and things that she seemed to develop over time. So I'm super excited to have this conversation, um, both to learn more about it myself. I, I know a little bit, but certainly not as much as you, but also to kind of, I think, bring some attention to a story that I think not a lot of people know that has some really interesting facets to it and some really interesting insight into her life and and what was going on around her at that time. So I guess at the beginning, maybe the best thing to do is talk a little bit about who was she in, in the bare bone sense, you know, her family, where she comes from, her background before we start diving into some of the nitty gritty. So, so who was Princess Alice? So I think the first thing to remember as you start to discuss who Princess Alice was, is to remember how German the British royal family was before the First World War. And to what extent the English character of the British royal family is really an invention of King George V, but especially of his wife, Queen Mary, who were both very German. So the present queen is actually probably the most British monarch um, that England has had, that the United Kingdom has had since Queen, since queen Anne in the early um, 18th century. Um, because of the Act of Settlement, which sort of ends um, the wars of the English Reformation, only a uh, Anglican can only a Protestant can sit on the throne of Great Britain. And what that meant was that upon the death of Queen Anne, her second cousin, um, George of Hanover, and Hanover is a German state, became king. And essentially from that point until the First World War, the British royal family is a German family. They speak German, they celebrate German holidays. Many of these we think of as a traditional Victorian Christmas, for example, um, is, are really German customs. And they're the house of Hanover. And then upon the marriage of Queen Victoria to Prince Albert, the house of Saxe, Coburg and Goethe, right? And Princess Alice is part of this minor branch of this confederacy of German families that, um, that is also English. So she is born in Windsor Castle in, in 1885. Her, she's a great granddaughter of Queen Victoria on her mother's side, um, but she's a Battenberg and she is a German princess. So she's a German princess who is raised as an English lady. 
And so she's she's a part of this, as I'm sure many people are aware of, of the fact that uh, Queen Victoria is related to like every royal family in Europe. She's a part of this large clan of of royals. I think he once said that Queen Victoria exported her children, and that's a, a part or a result of this as well. So she's she's raised in England, and and then what happens after that? Well, she's one of four children. Her eldest sister Louisa will go on to become Queen of Sweden. Um, her younger brother, um, her youngest brother, um, Louis, Montb Louis Montbatten will be the admiral, will go on to become the admiral of the British fleet. Um, her brother George has a very successful British naval career. He's also a mathematician. Um, her Majesty the Queen described him as the smartest man I've ever met. Um, so these are, this is a very interesting family um, that is that Louis Montbatten, um, her father, Prince Louis Mont of Montbatten is a um, British naval officer, her mother, Princess Victoria of Hesse, um, and by Rhine is, is a sort of interesting figure. But um, she, it's very clear from early on that Alice isn't like the other children and she isn't learning to speak. And so um, Princess Victoria um, takes her to, um, to auditory specialists in Germany this is a new discipline, right? We're talking about the 1890s. This is a new discipline. Um, and it's discovered that she's effectively completely deaf. She has some residual hearing in her left ear and we'll talk more about that. But she is completely deaf um, for all practical purposes. And the approach that Princess Victoria takes to handling this is unique. So one thing you have to remember is the, the British royal family, the Hanovers, is haunted, and this will become important as well again in Princess Alice's life, is haunted by the scepter that there is a strain of madness, right? So King George III, um, the madness of King George, people familiar with American history are familiar with this. And so the whole family is just sort of nervous of any, even more, you know, all aristocrats, all nobles are nervous about this kind of idea that there's some sort of imperfection in their bloodline, right? Because they're claiming all this authority via their bloodline. But here you have um, a, a morgamatic branch of the royal family. So they had, she has a grandmother who is not royal. And so they cannot be styled their royal highnesses. She's born your serene highness, right? So she's from this kind of quasi-royal already the, you know, part of the family. There's this hint, this you know, fear of the madness of King George. And right. so they don't deal with disability well, right? I mean, and this and, is also, I mean, Princess Alice is born in 1885. This is like long before our current kind of conception or understanding of disability advocacy or or, or anything like that. Exactly. And so um, Lady Pamela Hicks, who is Louis Montbatten's younger daughter and um, the niece, of course, then uh, of Princess Alice, um, she, she says that, you know, the family story about this was um, Princess Victoria sort of declares that if if Alice can't understand you, don't repeat yourself because she has to learn. And she's just sort of thrown in and forced um, to, to adapt. And this does pay off in some way, right? And, and correct uh, me if I'm wrong, but they don't they don't like sign with her or anything, right? They just kind no. of force her to, to learn via lip reading. And that is the only means of communication that she has access to. Absolutely. So there's yeah. no um, sign language is actually sort of formal sign language during their infancy in the late 19th century. Um, education for the deaf is still, it's starting to happen, but it doesn't really, um, it's certainly not in royal circles where women aren't really, you know, royals aren't going to be sent to school till the middle of the 20th century. So you can imagine she, she is just not, they just won't repeat things to her. They don't sign. She has to learn to read lips. And by the time she is a young woman, she can lip read in three languages, in German, French, and English, which are really the languages of the, the, the British court at that point. We see from early on, she has this kind of character, this char incredible adaptability and incredible resilience, I think. And that's like a really remarkable thing to, to, to do for, I mean, to one, to force on anybody, but for a young woman to be able to not only adapt as, as un almost entirely deaf to, to being able to communicate 
in general, but then in three separate languages is really remarkable. It gets crazier. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. We're gonna keep going with this. So so then so she by the time she's a, you by the time she's a young woman, you know they've they've kind of realized that she is 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 she entirely deaf at this point, or is she still has some residual hearing? Or she has she still has a little bit of residual hearing though. It it's what's happening is her hearing is decreasing. Degrading. It's degrading. degrading. So by the time she's a young woman, she she can lip read in three languages. And, and then what happens? Um, in 1902, um, Edward VII is, is, court, is crowned king of, of the United Kingdom. And while at the coronation, she meets the youngest son, the fourth son of King George I of Greece um, and his wife, who is um, Olga of, of Russia, who's a Russian grand duchess. That will be important as well. And Prince Andrew. And um, she is smitten. Um, there's some there's some indication that you know he's kind of remember crowds are always going to be difficult for her her whole life. Big parties are always going to be difficult for her. We're talking about parties that are still largely candlelit or dim um, gas lighting. Um, you're talking about lots of people gathered around, and if you're deaf and reliant on lip reading that is going to be a real struggle. And it also, I mean, it requires line of sight to actually engage it all too. So if someone's trying to get your attention anywhere that is not in your direct line of vision, that's the really overwhelming situation to be in. in I mean, what? even if it's like a casual, like you're casually at your friend's party, that would be an incredibly overwhelming situation, let alone massive state events of great political importance. And I mean, one thing, um, you know, Lady Pamela Hicks, um, speaking about her aunt said that I think makes a lot of sense look at the images you've seen of dinner tables in the Victorian and Edwardian age and those massive centerpieces. Oh Lord, I hadn't even thought about that. Like imagine having to try wow. to lip read over these massive centerpieces. So there is in, sort of this- In candlelight at these long tables where half the time the people that are also around, I mean, also just thinking about line of sight in terms of these long tables where a lot of people are then just going to be perpendicular to you tricky situation to be in. Well, this is actually where the residual sh hearing she did have was actually up to some detriment to her. So some she could hear, for example, loud laughter at the end of the dinner table, um, but she had no way of seeing what was being laughed at or who. And she internalized a lot of that. And the sort of story is that, you know, Prince Andrew um, spoke slowly, to her. Um, his English may not have been excellent. And so he had to speak slowly when he spoke English and enunciate. And she was sort of spent with him for that reason. Um, and so they were married in October of 1903 um, in a civil ceremony in um, Darmstadt in Germany. They get married in Germany. Um, and then there's two religious ceremonies, which we wouldn't really do today. And this kind of shows you, this is interesting because it shows you how much more flexible those lines between the Eastern and Western church were um, sort of before the, the Russian revolution. So they get married in, the, in a Lutheran service at the Evangelical Castle Church, and then a Greek Orthodox one at the Russian chapel nearby. And she, as, a royal arist and aristocratic woman do, she adopts the style of her husband and becomes Princess Andrew of Greece. She's known as Princess Andrew at that point. And she moves with her husband back to his home country of Greece. So this is the beginning of her, of her married life and her life is a very conventional royal life. And there is this period of time um, really between 1903 and 1913 where she lives the life of, um, of a very conventional royal, royal woman. Does charity work, has children, does all those things. Goes to state events and interacts with other diplomats and politicians, you know, the kind of thing that you would expect. By the way, she learns to lip read in Greek at this point. That was what I was about to ask you about. Yep. And and correct me if I'm wrong, but she isn't she one of the only royals at that moment who actually does speak Greek? She is. So I mentioned kind of vaguely the, the Greek royal family is German and Danish. 
um, for, for all intents and purposes. And so the, um, the Greek royalty at that point really speaks German and Danish. They don't speak Greek. And she's one of the few that goes out of her way to learn Greek. There is so much kind of said about Princess Alice. I think one thing that is unremarked on that should be is just her sheer intellect, right? That I mean, was, you have to be, right? You have to be yeah. incredibly intelligent to do that. There's no other I mean, you, way. You have to, I mean, you really have to be very intelligent. And the, the truth and adaptable. is- adaptable. You have to adapt incredibly quickly. I mean, you, and that sort of, I think one of the real tragedies of Princess Alice's life is that she had all the, the sort of the gifts she had were completely unsuited for her time and place. And the um, challenges she had were uniquely difficult in her time and place. Yeah, absolutely. And she was existing in a moment that was not as equipped to assist someone in that situation as, I mean, which is not to say that we are perfect in this moment because we still have plenty of problems in terms of things like that that we need to address, but even more so at the turn of the 20th century where she's she's existing at this point. Um, and she might have actually had, I mean, one thing I think is really interesting and an interesting part of the conversation I think to have about this is she might have actually had more access to to assistance, to access, accessibility services, I guess is what we call them now, but to, to help um, if she had been kind of born into the emerging middle class. Right, because there is that element of, of head of state pressure, public facing. And the anxiety her family's feeling around this, right? And, uh, and as you kind of touched on, when, when your, your bloodline is your claim to power, <laughs> that adds a whole another layer of pressure around that. Yeah, so I think I think if she had been, I mean, you look at, you look at figures like um, Helen Keller, right? Right. Um, whose parents did seek out um, assistance for her. Helen Keller is part of this kind of nouveau riche, upper middle class, you know, American, um, but capitalist elite, um, which, is much more of a meritocracy. It's much more interested in skill and as opposed to bloodline. And so doesn't necessarily have to have the same anxieties around that. And around I, will, I will add here for context, Helen Keller and, and Princess Alice are actually incredibly contemporaneous. Helen Keller is born in 1880 and Princess Alice is born in 1885. So this is, this is really, they are very comparable in that, in that sense. They are existing in this, I mean, geographically, and of course, you know, situationally, they are vastly different. However, time frame wise, they are contemporaneous with each other. And I think, I mean, it really points, I think, to the real, um, you know, this is some, if she had been born, not even necessarily in a different time, but in a different circumstance, her life would probably, different. yeah, it would have probably looked very different. So, um, but this, this kind of idyllic life, right? um is interrupted like everything by what we call the 20th century <laughs> kind of funnily enough I mean I was I was doing some preparation for this this morning and I was looking at the Wikipedia page and and this section of her Wikipedia page is titled successive life crises um which will I guess foreshadow a little where this is headed but so as you said her 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 more typical royal experience is interrupted by the 20th century uh, with a, a lot of warfare and various other crises. What comes first? What is the first of these unfortunately dubbed successive life crises that she experiences? Yeah, so the first thing to remember is Greece in the early 20th century is incredibly politically unstable. Um, Princess Alice had probably married into one of the, to the most unstable royal house outside of Russia, maybe, in Europe right? I mean, just absolutely on the brink. And her husband um, becomes involved in um, this sort of political conflict where Athens is refusing um, to support the Cretan parliament um, and bring Crete into the Greek nation. Crete is still nominally part of the Ottoman Empire, which is why my great-grandparents were all born in a country that no longer exists. Um, and this causes, um, this causes all sorts of dissatisfaction 
within the, the Greek Nationalist Military League. And Prince Andrew is forced to resign um, as, as this, this new government rises in power, resigns from his military post. Um, his resignation is short-lived though, because um, the Balkans War begins in 1912 and he's reinstated um, into the army. And the Balkans War sort of is connected to and bleeds in, there's this is kind of a complicated history, but the Balkans War is connected to and sort of bleeds into the First World War. And Greece is, um, so the King of Greece, King Constantine the First, um, declares a policy of neutrality in the First World War. But the democratically elected Greek government sides with the allies. And so you have this, the king is pursuing one policy and the government, the elected government is pursuing another policy. The, and Athens is being bombarded um, and Princess Alice and her children are, are forced to hide in, she at this point has four daughters. They're forced to hide in the palace. And by, the middle of 1917, it becomes clear the king's policy of neutrality is completely untenable, right? It's just completely um, unmanageable and, and untenable. And um, the members of the Greek royal family are forced into exile when King Constantine the first abdicates. This is the first exile that Princess Alice will experience. And I know you're saying to yourself, self, the first exile. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't bode well, does it? That's like, you, that's the thing you hear and you get that like sinking feeling in your chest. Yeah. And they're, they're in exile when the First World War ends, when the Treaty of Versailles is signed. And the first, the end of the First World War really spells the end of the, the Ancien Regime, right? Like of um, the, so I would argue, and I have argued, not much in the world changes between, or in the Western world, changes between, you know, the Edict of Milan, Constantine legalizing Christianity, and the end of the First World War, and then everything changes, right? The basic structures underlying Western civilization, the power of the church, and the power of the monarch are basically intact with, you know, you have the process I and mean, you have you have, some, you have some fluctuation in there between who is more powerful than any given time, the monarch or the church. There's some struggling that happens there throughout medieval history and all that, but. I mean, but that system and the feudal structures that support it are in place basically, right? and. And the First World War destroys all that. And all over Europe, um, monarchies collapse. If you're a fan of, fan of Downton Abbey, that is really the story of what's happening as the sort of aristocratic and royal order crumbles. Um, and she is there watching this sort of happening around them. Moreover, um, there is incredible, one of the things that's happened in the First World War in Britain going back to what you're talking about before, remember the British royal family is a bunch of Germans. <laughs> They're just a bunch of Germans at this point. Um, and there is a lot of anti-German sentiment. So a little bit King George V, but also Queen Mary of Tech, his, his German British wife. She's part of this whole um, like Princess Alice, like German princesses raised as British ladies group. Um, Really, Queen Mary and King George's private secretary um, concoct a plan that is um, that saves the British monarchy and really creates the royal family as we know it today. I will send you, Cairo, the information for a great biography of Queen Mary called Matriarch. Um, but this this does two, the plan has two parts, three parts to it. The first part is be more public and likable. So like, you know how the queen runs around like shakes hands, like opens hospitals? Queens didn't do that before, okay? That's, that's Queen Mary's idea. That's King George and Queen Mary's idea. The second is 
change our name from Saxe Coburg Goethe, because that sounds very German, to Windsor, the name of the oldest inhabited castle in England. Because that just sounds, if I say Windsor to you, Kyra, what does that sound like to you? Very British. It's a good PR idea. It was a good plan. <laughs> I mean, it stuck around. So. Exactly. It's a good idea. Clever. The, the third idea, though, affects Princess Alice. And that is to make all of these miscellaneous German royals they have hanging around give up their German titles. And so Prince Louis of Battenberg, Alice's father, and his children give up their German titles and become the Monbattens. Exactly. So they give up their titles. So her title, that's why she's Princess Alice. That's why she's Alice, Princess Andrew, Priest, because that Alice of Battenberg, that's been given up, right? That's been renounced. So that's why um, Lord Louis Mountbatten is, um, was Lord Louis Mountbatten, not um, Prince Louis of Battenberg. I say this as a joke, but it's actually kind of not a joke. Um, if they, if this, if the First World War had not happened, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's son would be Archie, Sax von Coburg, and Goethe Glücksberg. That's a mouthful. Yeah. Because remember when um, Prince Philip becomes, um, gives up his Greek title to marry Princess Elizabeth, he adopts his mother's family name. Battenberg, his father's family is the Glücksberg. Um, so he adopts his mother's made up family name of Montbatten and becomes Lieutenant Philip Montbatten. So much so, interesting PR maneuvering that's happening. So just remember, Archie Harrison Montbatten Windsor is really Archie Harrison Sachs Coburg and Goethe Glücksberg. Um, what do you know? The more you know. Around this time, right, we also we were seeing a lot of, as you kind of mentioned, this destabilization of the aristocracy in many ways, right, and, and a lot of Princess Alice's family in various parts of the world are, are being assassinated or deposed and so on and so forth. The, the, the Bolshevik, Bolshevik revolution happened. Um, and, but and her Greece, relations are caught up in that as well to not so great ends for many of them. But Greece is getting their king back. <laughs> Because the Greeks are always fighting the tide. Um, in 1920, King Constantine is restored to his throne and the family returns to Greece and Prince Andrew and his father, um, Prince Andrew and his family set up, um, kind of set up shop in Corfu. So as sort of royal houses are falling all over Europe, um, Alice's English family has had to renounce their German titles. Um, her family in Russia has been killed. Um, there is all sorts of upheaval. The Greeks invite um, invite King Constantine to return to Greece. And the family and Prince Andrew's family returns with him and they return in the middle of the Greco-Turkish War. And the Greco-Turkish War, um, which is fought sort of on the heels of the First World War between 1919 and 1922, is an incredibly bloody conflict. And this is where Princess Alice, Princess Andrew, as she's being styled at the time, um, where I think she really stops being a conventional royal wife and becomes something really special. If, if all the other really fascinating things about her, like being able to lip read in four languages didn't already mark her as, as exceptional, it's, go it's just going to keep compounding. This woman is really, truly incredible. But yes, Katie, what, what, what is this beginning of setting her apart in that way? Yeah, so there is a long history of royal women sort of spot supporting the Red Cross supporting, mili um, supporting um, military nursing efforts. Princess Alice takes it to a whole different level. She goes to the front line, is trained as a nurse, and essentially serves as a combat medic on the front line. Which is, Remarkable for any person to, to put themselves in a situation like that, but but she you you kind of you know 
nailed it in terms of the idea that she goes, uh, we'll say, above and beyond, I guess, the expectation or convention for a woman in her position. And, and all of that would be remarkable for any woman in general or any woman in her position, but is made even more remarkable, once again, by the fact that she is almost entirely deaf and is now existing in the front lines situation of a war. I mean, it is, and the letters, the letters she writes to her mother, for example, during this period are incredible. She is, she is not sort of, you know, you, know, you kind of see like, I don't know, the president or the queen kind of walking through, or the Duchess of Cambridge kind of walking through and looking at stuff. That is not what she's doing. She is wrapping bandages. She is, you know, hiding in rooms as they take air bombardments she is she's a nurse and she's a nurse on the front line in a war um Greece is destined to lose that's a remarkable woman as far as I'm concerned and we're about to get to the really sad portion of her life but I think I hope thus far we've established like she is a truly I think an incredibly special character when the war ends she but when she returns home, she becomes pregnant with, with Prince Philip. And Greece is, there's a lot of upheaval in Greece at the, the, their defeat, following the defeat in the Greco-Turkish War. And finally, um, in a military coup, King Constantine is forced from power. Um, Prince Andrew, her husband, is arrested. Um, remember she's pregnant as this is going on she's just returned from a war zone now her husband's been her her um the king has fled um her husband has been arrested and after a brief trial he's convicted and sentenced to be shot and oh, good god sorry just yeah like and um british diplomats who had remember so the kind of backstory to this is um, the czar had written to George V, who was his first cousin, begging him to send a British, um, a British warship for them to escape. And the Bolsheviks were originally willing to allow the, royal fam the Russian royal family to go into exile in Britain. And then the princesses got sick and couldn't go immediately. The grand duchesses, I'm sorry, got sick and couldn't go immediately. And in that period that they were sick, the three weeks they were sick, um, the government advises George V against rescuing his cousin and he pulls back the warship. And of course we all know what happens. Um, so it's safe to say George V is, very nervous about these relatives of his getting killed. He was actually very close to Tsar Nicholas as well. I mean, I bet that was a, a heavy weight on his conscience after that happened. That's probably not something you you get over easily. I mean, I mean, they they're, they look a lot. I mean, I don't know if you've seen pictures of George V and um, Tsar Nicholas. It's shocking. So British diplomats, um, they assume that, um, that Prince Andrew is in, is in a great deal of trouble and they send the British cruiser, um, the HMS Calypso to come and get um, Prince Andrew's family and, and take them back to Britain. And um, Princess Alice goes into labor as this plan is being hatched. Um, she has Prince Philip on the kitchen table, and he is then um, summarily wrapped up, put in an orange cart, um, and they escape on the HMS Calypso and go into exile. Right. Well, um, a lot has already happened, and oh dear audience, a lot more is going to before the end of this. We are not near the end yet. So at this point, this woman has already lived a quite remarkable life. She has been a frontline nurse. She has, has had a child and then immediately fled. What is the status of her husband at this point? Is he able to escape with them? Is he still in custody? He is let go um, on a, you know, a moment of just incompetence, essentially. They let him go um, and he's able to escape with them. And the whole family um, goes into ex exile um, outside of Paris in a place called Saint Cloud. Um, it's on the outskirts of Paris, and they are they are refugees. 
they she gets i mean one of the the sort of um this is in the biography the um the vicar's biography it's also something that um countess Montbatten, the daughter of the oldest daughter of, of louis Montbatten, talks about um the countess of burma um that's just shocking so when they flee Philip's four sisters and Princess Alice have to go to a charity shop run for refugees to get new clothes because they don't have anything but the clothes on their back. Um, so they, so they're literally wearing- This is truly, they are fleeing. This is not like a nice, cushy, like diplomatic exchange. They are truly running. Exactly. I mean, they are they are actually fleeing. And um, she has, like the, like the Russian princesses, they've sewn, um, they've sewn some jewelry into the the lining of their dresses and actually the the glass diamonds she manages to sneak out this is how poor the family continues to be um so they have great connection they're not poor like people who have were poor and have no connections but they're you know certainly they don't have any money and um the engagement ring that philip ultimately gives to princess elizabeth they can't afford to buy new jewelry for this and he's about to propose to the heir to the british throne and so um princess alice will end up giving him the last of the diamonds that she smuggled out with her to put in princess elizabeth's ring and the the engagement ring you see the queen wearing to this day those are the last of princess alice's jewels which is kind of a i mean it, it has an incredibly storied history but it's actually kind of a really interesting detail of all of this that's kind of yeah. interesting to, to, to see so they flee they flee to england and or no you i'm sorry they flee to, to france and they're in france now and and then what happens while they're in france so in 1928 um she converts to the greek orthodox church um she'd been practicing i mean the religious lines, like I said, were much more fluid, um, but she, she, become, she officially becomes Greek Orthodox. And she also translates into English um, her husband's defense of his actions in the Greco-Turkish War. Um, and these are published and they become a serious political thing. Again, um, the level of intelligence of this woman who then translates for her husband into a new language because she speaks four languages. Just a reminder again, in case you forgot how smart this woman is. And a recognition that this is an important um, PR tool. Absolutely. Right? Um, I think, and to sway the British public to their side and the American public, um, it needs to be translated and she does that. And then around this time, she starts to have visions of Christ and Buddha. Um, and I think this, this to me is some of the most interesting territory about her. Um, it is very clear that she has, beginning in 1930, some sort of serious mental health crisis um, that is diagnosed as paranoid schizophrenia. Remember, this is the heyday of modern psychiatry. She's actually seen by Sigmund Freud, for and example. I'll, I'll also add here that this is this is also a time in history where women are diagnosed with hysteria as as a as an official diagnosis for things, which you know, is an interesting comment on the state of, of health opinions at that moment, but yeah. <laughs> Much of the writing she produces at this time is incredible. The language she's using to describe these, these spiritual experiences is incredibly erotic. And it's very clear from reading her mother's letters, as well as from reading Sigmund Freud's notes on his examination of her, that what they're really offended by is this well brought up lady using this erotic language. Which is interesting to me. I mean, my, my background in, in, in my history studies, I did a lot of medieval European history. And that's actually, there's a lot of that, at least in the Catholic, there are many Catholic female saints who use very erotic language in their, in their visions of Christ or other angels and things like that. That's, there's a, a long tradition and a long standard of that. That's actually, you know, just for the audience, you know, that's not an outlier. That's not terribly unusual. That's actually, there's a long, long history of that. Exactly. And this is what is so, I think this is what's so complicated for me about this. I believe she was having mental health. I believe she was suffering from some very severe trauma. I mean, everything that she's already been through at this juncture, it, it, it's an understandable reaction. Yeah, no, I think she was, she was 
but here's the thing i think she was i think she was experiencing what we now probably diagnose as ptsd but i also think that she in terms of the religious stuff which becomes the big the big sort of evidence against her of her insanity i think she is someone who is very well read who had read a lot of um christian mysticism as well as eastern mysticism there's a lot of eroticism she, in Christian mysticism, including people who are dubbed saints who write in very erotic ways about their experiences with visions I mean, she, and so on. And she also reads a lot of, I mean, she reads a lot of like Indian mysticism, which is also very erotic. I think this is a Katie Kaleidas opinion, not a, I do not think that mystic writing she does is evidence that is evidence of a mental health problem while recognizing she did have mental health issues. Does that make sense? And there are some questions, I mean, I, I, I referenced this a minute ago, but this again, this is also the moment where women are often have a, an official diagnosis of hysteria when they are expressing any kind of discontent in their lives and things like that. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I would probably hazard a guess to say there's a, a great deal of, a, a great deal of the assessment of this is probably largely to do with the fact that she's a woman as well. And it might be treated differently if she was not. Yeah, and I think, I think if she was, and once again, this goes back to like, she's not just a woman, she's a royal woman. She is a Victorian lady. And this is also, I mean, before we actually have PTSD as like a diagnosis, this is, this is in the, the period where they're still calling that shell shock, right? This, yeah. is, this is pre the way we talk about these kinds of things now, or the way we understand them now, this predates that. I mean, it, it's hard to, I mean, really it's hard to tell, like, for example, in her mother's letters about this, um, it's really about the, the mystic writing, like if she's offended, if she's concerned that she's having visions, or if she's offended that she's using language that talks about like orgasms and things. So regardless of what we think, certainly the people around her um, believe that she is insane, as they would say, and she is sent um, to a sanitarium, she's sent to a, an asylum. And this is an early 20th century asylum. This is not um, nice. And it's very clear um, Prince Andrew is um, likely trying to just get rid of her um, because he is having affairs. And in 1930, between 1930 um, and 1931, she's sent to, to a sanitarium. And really for the next eight years, she is out of contact with her family and the family sort of falls apart. And this is why, you know, Prince Philip's only nine years old when this happens. And that's why he's kind of raised essentially as an orphan. His father's out doing his thing and his mother is, is gone. It's in these, it's going from sort of being sent to these different asylums and things. It's, it's incredibly sad. It is incredible. But it's not the last act. It is incredibly sad. But she has more remarkable life left to live. This is not the end of this conversation. So, so she is confined at yeah. this asylum. But that is not where her story ends. Where how how does she how does she leave the asylum? Since that is not the end of this this story or her life. Far from it, well, actually. So she did break out of the asylum at one point, but she's sent back. Um, but in I also just love the fact that she just breaks out. She's like, no. And it's important to note here too that during this period, she consistently is protesting that she is not insane. Yeah. She is confined against her will. I just think it's an important thing to explicitly say this is not something she has agreed to. No, and this and once again, I think there's there's evidence in both ways. But in 1937, um, her daughter Cecilia, her son-in-law, and their grandchild are all killed. Grandchild and her grandchildren are all killed. Um, in an air, in a plane crash. And Prince Andrew sort of lets her come, lets her come to the funeral. It's the first time they're reunited. Um, it's the first time she sees Prince Philip and her brother, um, Louis Mountbatten, um, is during that period. And it is after her daughter's funeral that she is sort of never sent back to the asylum. Um, she kind of gets out that way. And she alone um, returns to Greece um, with the idea of working with the poor. 
and she rents a two bedroom flat above the Banaki Museum. So, which is very, a two bedroom flat above the Banaki Museum is very different than um, Windsor Castle. Um, but it's 1938. So, so uh, I don't think uh, about what Europe was like in 1938. Yeah, I, anyone paying attention at home probably knows where this is going. It seems Princess Alice's experience with mass war is not over yet. 1938 is quite a moment. In, in, in our history and we are gearing up into our next massive conflict of World War II. And so she is in Athens. What happens as, as Europe continues to destabilize at this moment? So one thing to remember that we didn't really touch on is that um, between 1930 and 1931, as she's sort of in the beginnings of whatever this crisis, this mental health slash being unfairly, I think, um, maligned crisis is all four of her daughters marry German, nope, German royals, German aristocrats. And so her son-in-laws are all fighting on the side of Germany. In fact, two of her son-in-laws are fairly high ranking members of the SS. Ouch. And she and her sister-in-law, um, Princess Nicholas, are in Athens. Of course, Greece is eventually occupied by Germany. Um, but most of the other, most of the Greek royal family leaves for South Africa, but they stay. So now these two women whose the rest of their family has fled, they are alone and remaining in Greece during the period of Nazi occupation. Exactly. And she moves out of her flat. She moves into this three-story house um, in the center of Athens um, that, it, that belongs um, to her brother-in-law, Prince George. And she sets up a Red Cross center with a soup kitchen. At one point, her sister, who is crown princess of Sweden at this point, neutral Sweden, she flies to Sweden and gets medical supplies and brings them back through war-torn Europe, which is, so, I mean, she flies there, but these are the skies above Europe in 1940. They are a battleground. Quite literally. Quite literally. I mean, this is incredibly brave. Um, and it is during, I think, the, um, so the, her, her, the home she's turned into, um, she has orphaned and lost children staying there. She's going on nursing calls around poor neighborhoods. Remember, she's trained as a nurse and she's actually doing nursing work in these neighborhoods. I'm going to throw out there that this is some evidence that she is not um, completely the, the mentally kind of unfit. Men mentally unfit. unfit. Yeah. And that, I mean, she's just better all of a sudden. I mean, unless we have an incredible amount of faith in 1930 psychiatry, which. Right. Um, she is friends with a woman named Rachel Cohen. And after Germany invades Greece, um, she hides Rachel and two of her children um, in her um, in her um, in her three-story house in the center of Athens for the duration of the war. And they had been, she knew him because um, Rachel's husband had been an aide to George the first um, and he had helped them during um, during the sort of period the initial periods of upheaval um, in, in Greece in the early 20th century. Um, so Princess Andrew saves the Cohen family from the Nazis um, and she really, one of the reasons she's able to do this, literally hide a Jewish family in the center of Athens in this, you know, make, you know, this nice house in the center of Athens. During um, the is, occupation while they are during the, yeah. Um, one of the reasons she's able to do that is because um, she knows who she is, which is a German princess with two son-in-laws who are high-ranking SS officers. And she is a thorn in the side of the Nazis for this reason, because they can't get rid of her. 
And, and there's, isn't there that this, this great story, like a German officer asks her at one point in 1940 what he can do for her and her response is essentially get out of my country, right? Like yeah. there's, there's this great story about that, which I think is awesome, but. So yeah, so this is, um, this is great. I'll tell the story if you want me to. Like, I, I think it's, I think it's, yeah, I think it's, it's super interesting. So she's kind living of. in Prince George's house um, in the center of Athens, one of those kind of grand three-story houses um, in the Plakia. You can still go see, you know, there's still houses like that, but many have been turned into condos because the, the world is now a giant condo, basically. Um, and so she is, she's a Battenberg princess. Her son-in-laws are high-ranking SS officers. And so the German um, commandant of Athens comes and visits her. And he says, you know, Your Royal Highness, is there anything that I or my, my soldiers can do to make you more comfortable? And she says, I will be comfortable and rest when you leave my country. Which is such, and a, she's, which is such an excellent response. By the way, she says it to him in her very perfect, very regal German speaks four languages unbelievable and this is i mean this is i think this is this, you this know, she is, is i say well, i don't say this lightly she is a remarkable person and so she's remembered um she's remembered as one of the righteous among the nations um but she really does you know i think we kind of we live in a pure we we live in an era um when people talk about um, sort of using your privilege, right? And she, her whole life, I think we, one of the things I think it's clear, her whole life being royal was not good to her all the time, right? And she really chafed under that. And yet when it became, when she could, when she saw a way she could use her royal status to help people, um to protect people she did yeah absolutely so harold Macmillan, who's the leader of the british opposition at this point visits her after um the liberation of greece in october of 1944 and he describes her as living in humble not to say somewhat squalid conditions um she writes a letter to um then lieutenant philip Mountbatten who is um, secretly engaged to Princess Elizabeth at this point, but nobody knows. Um, except by the way, Princess Alice, we have found the letter um, where he tells her, don't tell anyone, but after the war, a little bit and I, it's and, and then we, we go back to that story you told before with the jewels and the wedding ring and so on. Yeah, like, which by the way, this letter is, or engagement in, ring, excuse me. Engagement. This letter is incredible because he, he says, you know, really don't tell anyone, but after the war, when her father thinks it's appropriate and after she's 21, Lilibet and I are getting married. So, okay. So, but, clearly, um, so clearly he had some trust in her or he would not have <laughs> shared such a secret. Exactly. And you know, she writes to him that, you know, for, for the last week before the liberation, um, she is eating only bread and butter that she had not had meat in months. Part of this is because the German, um, the Nazis are actually giving her a ration. She's having food brought to her and she's giving it away. She was particularly horrified at the idea that she would be eating meat um, when there were these children who were starving who really needed the protein to survive. So she certainly her, her meat rations, she was giving away from very early on in the war. Um, but even those stopped coming when the German supply trains were, were broken down. So um, she was, once the British get there and are, and are in Athens, um, she becomes kind of a headache to them. <laughs> um, so she does things like she continues As a headstrong to, woman in this period is. So they me. have, I mean, she is the, she's still a, British, I mean, they kind of give up their titles, but like realistically, she's a British princess. Um, she's in a diplomatic nightmare at some level because she keeps walking around the streets, like, you know, helping poor people and like moving homeless people into her palace. And um, this is not ideal for the, the British officers. 
but I, there's a great story on here. It's even on her Wikipedia page because it's so brilliant. Um, and one of the things they told was you're deaf, you can't just wander around the streets, you might get struck by a stray bullet, right? Um, and the the officer is trying is telling her like you're this you have to be careful because you can't be aware enough of your circumstances right like we're still in a moment the occupation is over but things are not necessarily entirely stable things are still unsafe so on and so forth exactly and like and remember greece is about to meld world war ii into um into a civil war so and the the officer tells you the sort of old british army truism um, which is, um, you know, you never hear the bullet that kills you. And her response is, they tell me that you don't hear the shot that kills you. And in my case, I am deaf. So why worry about that? What a woman. <laughs> what a woman. <laughs> oh, I love her. I love her. Like, like, absolutely um, brilliant during this period after the war that her husband dies. Um, and um, it's also during this period in, in April 47 um, that she returns to the United Kingdom for the first time um, for the November wedding of her only son, um, who has now been made created Duke of Edinburgh um, to Princess Elizabeth, the heiress presumptive to the British throne. Um, after the wedding of Prince Philip begins what I think is a really interesting period in her life. Um, as the end of her life is once again, equally fascinating. So in January of 1949, um, she decides to form a nursing order of Greek Orthodox nuns. And this is really unique. So Cairo, I believe you have seen you live in the great city of Chicago? I do. Um, have you seen nuns about? Oh, yes. Not every, every now and then, yes, I have yeah. seen nuns about. And uh, again, as I mentioned, I did study medieval European history. So nuns is a lot of the things that I've spent my time reading about, thinking about, and so on. But, you know, I'm, uh, and an interesting thing, though, I mean, that I've noticed in all of that is that there isn't really a lot of orthodox female monasticism in the way that there is in Catholicism. And I have a feeling this might be where you're going, but... Yes. So um, one of the things that happens during the Ottoman occupation is that the active orders of female monastics are shut down. So orders of female monastics involved in teaching and nursing, they're all shut down. They all become cloistered. Um, and then we have these German princess in the 20th century, um, these German princesses who marry into Orthodox royal families and convert to Orthodoxy revive that. Um, so Grand, the Grand Duchess, St. Elizabeth, the Grand Duchess now, Grand, the Grand Duchess Elizabeth, um, does this in Russia in 1909. She founds an order called the Christian Sisterhood of Martha and Mary, which seeks to revive the active order of Orthodox nuns. And Princess Alice loves this. Um, so St. Elizabeth has been martyred by the Bolsheviks at this point. St. Elizabeth is someone that, um, that um, is a cousin of um a princess alice by the way she's the sister of the tsarina so she's a cousin of princess alice so in 1949 she seeks to do the same for greece and she sets up her monastery um in in on the line on the island of tinos and basically her mother everyone is, is like baffled by this decision right because like they're like Who's gonna like who wants a nun who chain smokes? She's a chain smoker, by the way, too, through all this, as you would be. Um, and her as she's doing this, her daughter-in-law becomes queen. So if you watch the coronation videos of Queen Elizabeth, there's all the and her mother, like right, the Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother's got like the whole outfit on because she's the daughter of an earl, but she's more royal than the royals. And then there's this like little nun walking behind and that's Princess Alice. Um, she also like go in 1960, she goes to India and meets um, with um, Rakuma Amit Karu, who's this Indian, in, Indian spiritual leader, but also this leader of Indian independence. I remember Indian independence is only about 13 years old 
and her daughter-in-law is the queen is i mean it was her it was her daughter her son's father-in-law that they kicked out right and she goes and meets with them because she's in you know i think this is incredible she actually goes on this tour with with um with the countess Mountbatten of burma with edwina Mountbatten. um and this is where she she sort of takes sick um in um in 1967 the coup that places the junta in charge of greece happens and princess alice leaves greece for the last time um and the obvious place for her to go is to england where her son is now the prince consort and she goes there um and she dies in buckingham palace on December 5th, 1969. Um, she was incredibly frail physically at the end, but everybody in this, once again, I think this is important to that initial incident in the 1930s. Um, everybody who sees her at the end comments on how lucid she is, including Princess Anne, the Princess Royal. Um, Princess Anne has written um, extensively about her grandmother. And I think it provides some of the best defenses. Princess Anne becomes very close to her in those last years she's at Buckingham Palace. Um, in, the, in that last year that she's at Buckingham Palace, six, eight, seven months, I guess, at Buckingham Palace. Um, and Princess Anne, um, I would argue, believes, she would not come out with this, I think would argue, be, believes that she, her, her grandmother was always um, lucid. Right. And, and just for the audience, when she does pass away in 1969, she's 84 years old, so. She's, yeah, and she she's physically very frail at this point. But mentally, um, but mentally very lucid. And um, everyone who met with her in that period says the same thing, that she was completely, Prince Charles, um, Prince of Wales, Princess Anne, the Princess Royal, um, Louis Mountbatten, her brother, who had been part of the kind of cabal that had her institutionalized in the first place. He says she's completely lucid. His daughters, um, Edwina, Countess Mountbatten of Burma and Lady um, Pamela Hicks say the same thing. Right. Um, so she's initially buried in the crypt at St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle, um, but it was her wish to be buried at the convent of St. Mary Magdalene in Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. and um, there was, of course, there's conflict in the Middle East and it was very far away and it didn't look like that could happen. And actually her daughter, um, Princess George of Hanover, um, remember her daughters all married German aristocrats. She said, you know, it's too far away. And Princess Alice, cause she was awesome, said nonsense. There's a perfectly good bus service. Iconic. What a, what a she, said, she said that her daughter is the consort, right? I mean, it's like a deposed house, but like she's the consort to the Prince of Hanover. And she's like, I'll just I mean, take the bus. Yeah, <laughs> she's great. Like she doesn't know. Um, and actually, you know, Prince Philip in 1988 arranged to have her remains transferred to a crypt in the church on the Mount of Olives. And that is where um, she is buried to this day. And she, of course, the um, state of Israel um, invited her because she is one of the um, righteous among the nations. So that is that is her final resting place. You can go there um, and see her too. I have been to see her too. Um, I think she's a remarkable woman. And I, I'm so glad you agreed to do this with me because I think her story is not told um, enough. And I think she is, she's fascinating, right? Oh, I mean, don't thank me. I'm I'm excited we did this because I mean, like, I knew a little bit about her because I, I I'm a, a history nerd as always. But but I I I wanted to learn more about it. So this was a d delight for me. I get to I got to learn a lot about a woman that I already thought was really interesting, and there's even more to it than than I initially thought. And I I also think you know I mean those who have been paying attention to our our content won't be surprised that I think anytime we can kind of elevate a story that hasn't gotten told as often is is a win for us. So I'm really glad that we did this, and I think. Honestly, the, I know we've said, said this word a lot already today, but honestly, remarkable is is the only or is the best word that I can think of to describe this woman's life and all the things that she did and her many accomplishments. And I mean, she also went through so much and to consistently and, and definitely showed a remarkable amount of adaptability in, in the face of a whole lot of uh, less than ideal situations. 
I, I know we're, we're running a little long, but I have, I have one kind of point of personal privilege, if you don't mind. Of before. course. So St. her cousin, um, Elizabeth of uh, Bedranova, St. Elizabeth, the Grand Duchess, um, has been made a saint by the ecumenical patriarchate, by the patriarchate of Moscow. St. Mother Mary of Paris, who's kind of a contemporary of hers as well, has also been glorified as a saint in 2004. The family of Tsar Nicholas has been um, glorified as passion bearers. Yeah. I think that it is a inc- remarkable oversight um, fueled by Greece's very complicated relationship, understandably complicated relationship with their royal family, former royal family, and um, maybe some anti-German sentiment and also some ableism, quite frankly. I think it's a huge oversight that there is not at least some sort of movement to formally recognize her as a saint in the Orthodox Church. When I look at the other women who have become saints in the 20th century, um, certainly, I mean, St. Elizabeth the Grand Duchess comes to mind. It seems strange to me that there's not some effort to have her glorified as a saint. So if you're someone who has some authority that you're watching this, um, certainly the Orthodox Church, one of the great things about the Orthodox Church is saints are glorified in a grassroots sort of way. So people um, pray to saints and have relationships with them. And then they are formally recognized and glorified by the church. <laughs> well, I, uh, just a disclaimer as always, that all of these things are our personal opinions. and not opinions <laughs> oh, this, is, this is the point of personal privilege. Um, but I, I'm, I am, sh- I'm shocked as a historian and as like a faithful Orthodox Christian, like I'm shocked she's not been formally glorified. Wearing your cross today and everything. No, I mean, that's just, I mean, this is like a personal thing. I mean, obviously it's not the opinion of the National Hellenic Museum, but, right, but, um, you know. but, but like Katie's personal opinion, kind of looking at the landscape, I think it's largely probably a political thing. Um, and I'm on record, I mean, I'm on record right saying this, but um, yeah, I, I think it's shocking she hasn't been glorified as a saint. I, I do definitely think this is a story that should be told more often for so many various reasons. Um, and I'm excited that we got to to talk a little bit about this today and hopefully bring her into, into people's awareness that maybe didn't know about her before because her life and times are certainly really remarkable. There's also, uh, Katie mentioned to me before, there's a great biography about Princess Alice. So if you would like to learn more about her life and times, I will put the information in the video description as always. Um, since, you know, this was kind of a, a, a broad strokes overview of her life and times, and I'm sure there are, are a plethora of very interesting details in that biography as well. So if you want to read more about the life of Princess Alice, check that out in the video description. I will also add add information to the book you mentioned earlier, Matriarch, if you want to learn more about the ways in which the, the British royalty changed their stylization as a response to that anti-German sentiment. If you want to read more about that effort, I will also include that book in the in the video description as well. Uh, Katie, do you have anything you want to say to the people here at the end? No, um, I I hope you learned a little more about the life of, I, I think we've said the word, maybe overuse the word, but a truly remarkable um, woman and someone who I, you know, I personally admire. Um, yeah, Princess absolutely. Alice of Battenberg. Whenever people do those things, that's like, who are the top three people that you, you know, admire? Um, she's always on that list. I think she is a story about resilience. And, um, and compassion and um, an incredible will. Um, and I would say, I would add adaptability and strength of conviction to that list as well. Yeah. Um, and, and I think she's an addition to my list now that I know a little bit more about her of, of people that I am, I am deeply fascinated by and, and admire greatly as well. Well, thank you all for, to the folks at home as well for coming and, and, and listening to us talk a little bit about this really interesting life that that Princess Alice led and all of the things that she did. And, you know, as always, we're happy to have you here. Check us out on our various platforms. There's YouTube will recommend some other videos from our YouTube page at the end of this video, or check us out at our podcast at NHM Dialogues, or look at our several online exhibitions. There are links to all of those things below. As always, follow us on social media to stay updated about what we're doing. And we are appreciative, as always, for you you spending the time to, to listen to us talk. And uh, thank you so much again, Katie, for doing this and for sharing so much about this. I, uh, this is my, fa- I, I am lucky that I get to just like listen and absorb all these, these pieces of information. And thanks so much for coming and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. And thank you for indulging my, um, 
my very esoteric and as you can tell i'm really into this stuff. hey i'm always happy to indulge your esoteric interests <laughs> i could go there's more <laughs> there's more and you should read about princess alice and on that note thanks for coming we'll see you all again soon with another video in the next couple of weeks Bye bye, bye.